Hey everyone, right on the dot. My name is Andrew Krauss. I co-founded EventRight with Stephen Key over 20 years ago. And I am going to answer your questions today, a whole bunch of them. Uh, we did this last week and I had a blast. I, I think you guys had a lot of fun too. Um, if we had the ability to raise your hand, I'd say how many people attended last week? How many people are here? Welcome back to all of you who attended last week. And for those of you that didn't, Welcome. We're going to do this again next week, too, I believe. Um, so let's jump in, do some Q&A. This should be a lot of fun. Uh, first question that I got was from Tommy. Why should I know my manufacturing price of my product when I show a company my prototype slash my idea? It's their idea now. Isn't that their job? So you know, Tommy, you don't need to have all the manufacturing details quite often when you're licensing a product, but if you're completely clueless about what it would cost to manufacture the product, that's not good. So let's say they're making products that typically don't sell more than 19.95, right? And you come to them and you're like, oh, I think this is a cool product. And they look at it and they go, well, our take on this is going to be like, going to be like a $60 product. We don't sell $60 products, or I don't think the consumer would pay $60. So to have an idea of what people would pay for it and what you can manufacture it for is very important. Now, the vast majority of the time, let's say, I don't know what I have on this table here. I have these reading glasses. So um, let's say you got these reading glasses and you created um, something a little different. They I'm just making something up, guys, completely on the fly. Right here that retains, you change this a little bit, right? So let's say you're exercising, and let's say it's not reading glasses. Let's say it's sunglasses. You need them to stay on your head. Well, you got all the different devices to keep eyeglasses on the head, but you just want to do it with the sunglasses. Well, let's say these are sunglasses. Um, and your change was you just made the plastic wave in a slightly different way here so it keeps the eyeglasses on your head. Well, you know the manufacturing costs of this. So providing that the injection mold can do it, which we know it can, it's not gonna really raise the price up at all. So what I'm saying is, a lot of times, Tommy, you can look at existing products and you can make assumptions as to whether or not your product can be made and even at what price. So you should have that general field. So does that mean you need to go to China or you need to get quotes? Uh, as to what this would cost to make. Sometimes, but most of the time, our students don't bother with that. They look at the product and go, yeah, if they can make that for $5.99, I think they can make mine. I just added a hinge over here. But um, saying it's, and I like the way you stated it, it's kind of challenging. Well, it's their idea now, isn't that their job? No, their job is to deal with the wacky inventor that has this idea that's not even remotely priced appropriately because you tacked on 20 different features to it and nobody's gonna to wanna to pay that price. So it is your job to be level-headed and show them something that when they see it, they're gonna be like, hmm, yeah, I think we could do this. We might have some concerns. And if they wanna share a concern or two with you and you're creative and sometimes not everybody in these corporations are as creative, that's the big thing that you bring to the table, as an inventor, um, that you can go, oh, let me think on that. And then you come up with a solution. So no, it's not completely their job, but you're right though. Also, quite often you're gonna put some of that details of the costing out on them and they will go get quotes. But you need to have a ballpark idea based on existing stuff, not be doing things that you know will make it too expensive that people won't wanna pay for. So it's a great question, Tommy. And, and thank you for the nice words about us doing doing these Q&As for, for free and helping people. Um, okay, next one's from Kevin. Another great question. Uh, hey, Andrew, if you had a small kitchen appliance that was appropriate for DRTV, would you also send it to other companies? DRTV testing could take months, but the returns are greater. Many thanks. So this is a great question, and I see this fairly often. You might have a gadget or a gizmo, in this case, a, a kitchen appliance or gadget, and you might have two lists of potential licensees. For those of you who are brand new, you are the, as the inventor or the license or the inventor that sells the company to a, rents your idea, 
not sells it to a company, licenses it, and the licensee is the manufacturer that will pay you royalties. So um, in this case, you might have two lists of potential licensees, DRTV, which is, some of you may not know what that is, it's infomercials, you know, they, they pitch it on TV, and then these days, most of the time, you'll end up buying in a big box store, very few people order over the phone, they might over the, over the internet, but some products might be appropriate for DRTV, but for this kitchen gadget, Kevin, you also have a list of 10 or 20 companies that are standard consumer product companies that are selling in Walmart and Target and Bed Bath and Beyond, and you got that list too. So what Kevin's question is, you know, if I show it to DRTV and one of them likes it, it might take them months to kind of test it. So, but also DRTV is a weird industry, which is not true of other industries. They get really weird when they know you're showing it to other people. So what I would suggest, if you had a kitchen gadget, Kevin, and you could show it to standard kitchen gadget companies that are not infomercial companies, and then infomercial companies, I would always go for the infomercial companies first, not always, but most of the time. See if you get any traction there. If they do, they're notorious for wanting to get you signed up really quick, but it's usually not a full sign up. It's a sign up, here are some terms, we want to run some tests, okay? And that can take them quite some, while, some time and slow you down. And they probably don't want you showing it to anybody else during the time. And again, this is unique to the kitchen business. A lot of times in other industries, you'll have interest from a company, you'll be talking to them, and you will full on be showing it to everybody else too. With DRTV, you don't really want to do that. So I would show to DRTV first, Kevin. If somebody shows interest, give them the month or two they need to test. Just be patient and then reach out to other DRTV companies if nothing's getting traction there. Then reach out to all the standard consumer product companies. What Kevin said is DRTV, you know, the returns could be greater. You know, quite often the DRTV contracts, like the minimum guarantees are crazy big because they don't want to sell an itchy thing. Like it'll be like quarter million minimum guarantees, crazy stuff you don't normally see in other deals. And it's not that they're being so great to you. It's for basically, if it doesn't sell like hotcakes, they don't want it anymore anyway. So that's why they can agree to those terms. So if you ever see a DRTV contract and go, oh, I'm going to try to do the same thing with other companies, don't do that. It will kill a deal every time. Um, let's see. Antoinette. Hi, Andrew. How would I go about trying to pitch... Um, can you, can you hear me now? Okay, can you hear me? There, there we go. Uh, let's see, Antoinette. Hi, Andrew. How would I go about trying to pitch my product to a major hotel chain, or should I just pitch my product to a hotel supplier? Thanks in advance. Um, so this is a common misperception. You don't license. I'm going to explain, Antoinette, how it would work with a standard product so everybody can benefit. And then I'll explain how it would work with a, uh, a hotel product, a hotel type product. So you don't license to Walmart or Bed Bath & Beyond or Target or Walgreens or Rite Aid. You license to the company selling there. So if they have products in those stores, what do you know? You know they're currently in, let's say, Walgreens with these three products. They're a player right now today. So you license to the manufacturers that are selling at the retailers, not the retailers themselves. So now let's go to Antoinette, Antoinette's question. Hi, Andrew. Would, how would I go about pitching my product to a major hotel chain? So what you probably want to do with that is pitch to the distributors and the manufacturers that sell towels and towel racks and shower curtains to a hotel chain, right? And then license it to them and they will try to sell it to hotel chains. Now, uh, kind of an advanced thing you could do, which I really wouldn't start out with, because if you approach a company, let's say that's making shower curtains, and they're going to see the benefit, they see your sell sheet, they see your, your uh, video, and they're like, oh, this is intriguing. And what you send them is not for them. It's not for the distributor that sells the hotel chain. It's for the hotel chain. The advertisement is always for the end user, but you want them to be intrigued with your marketing materials and see it and go, oh yeah, if the hotel, our hotels that we sell to saw this, they would want it, okay? And then you want them to do a licensing deal with you. So now as this is more of an advanced technique, 
a kind of a last ditch effort, if you will. Let's say you do that. Let's say you do that with 25 companies that sell products to hotel chains. And this product is for hotel chains. And some people are kind of showing interest, but they're just not committing. Maybe they feel like it's too much risk. Now you could call hotel chains and see if they're interested. And if they are, let's say um, um, Marriott shows interest. And, you know, they'll be a little irritated because you might talk to the buyer and show them your sell sheet. And they'll go, yeah, I want this. Like, God, what's the pricing and all that? And you go, well, you know, I'm looking to license this actually to a company. But if a company presented this to you, would you be interested in buying it? And they're like, oh, yeah. You know, and then you take that interest. You go back to the ones that kind of showed interest, maybe the ones that didn't, too. And you say, look, I got Marriott interested in this. So, um, but anyway, so Antoinette, that's a very specific answer for your question. I hope you like that. But for everybody else, uh, for standard consumer products, not a hotel product, um, you don't license to the retailer. You license to the manufacturer that sells to the retailer. Now, with that said, do some retailers have their own house brands? Yeah, but most of them still to this day, they're trying to reduce cost on generic items, towels and chairs and different things. And they're not really innovative. So if you look at Walmart's house brands, and you don't always know what they are because they use different names. And you look at all our house brands, and it's all generic stuff. They're just trying to cut out the middleman. They're probably not going to innovate. House brands typically don't innovate. But some rare retailers might have innovative house brands. And in that case, you can license to the retailer. But for the most part, 98% uh, of the time, you're licensing to the manufacturer that sells to the retailer. And I can't tell you how many inventors are confused on that. It's so simple. Hopefully you guys get that. Um, and it's not something you, you guys should be confused on from here on out. Uh, okay, so let's see what else we got here. Wow, we got so many questions, guys. This is fantastic. Um, let's see. Uh, Yoch, Yoch Chris. Is this a good time to do follow-ups with companies in the U.S., or is it better to wait until things calm down? I'm sure he's referring to the virus. I think it's a fantastic time to follow up with companies, to get into companies. Um, the boots on the ground that we have at InventRight are our coaches and our students. And what we're finding is a lot of these marketing managers, they're working from home, pretty much a ton of them, but most of them. And they seem to be paying more attention to their email and their LinkedIn account. So our students are actually getting into these marketing uh, marketing managers at these companies a little bit better than they normally do. And you're like, whoa, gee, I wouldn't have thought that, Andrew. I mean, think about all the time that's wasted in a regular workday, commuting, sitting around the water cooler, all that. I wouldn't be surprised if a percentage of these marketing managers that work for these companies you're trying to license to are more productive now than they were when they were in at work. And just think about it, like, you know, a lot of them, they are worried about their job. So they're paying closer attention to their LinkedIn. Their boss might email them. They're doing better with their email. Um, might you get a hold of some less companies uh, via the phone? Yeah, I think that's probably true, but that's been a trend for a long time. At InventRight, we firmly believe in both reaching out on the phone and on LinkedIn. We believe that it's important to do both. But on the phone, you're going to get a few less people at this time before you would get less people, you know, than if you're reaching out on LinkedIn. But I, th I still think it's important. It's just a call. You just call. And if nobody picks up, nobody picks up. It takes you two seconds. And if you got 20 companies, you could, you could ratchet through those very, very quickly. So I think it's an excellent time. And a percentage of you, not all of you, but a percentage of you have a little bit more time at home right now. You know, so if you do, if you're one of those people, um, some of you don't. Some of you have kids at home. Some of you have, um, you know, you're working very hard from home. You're working from home. Some of you have other obligations. But, uh, but a percentage of you have a little bit more time. So I think it's a great time to, to reach out, Yoch. Um, it's a cool name, by the way. Um, so Eva says, Eva uh, Green, can, can I patent it with a contract or license? So, and, and thank you, Eva, I, I appreciate, because I think I appreciate your question, even though it's not very specific, but I'm going to tell you what she really means, um, because people ask this all the time. People don't understand the difference between a patent 
the product and the licensing contract, okay? So first off, our students license stuff all the time without a patent. So Stephen and I like to say that to shock people. Do we always recommend our students file a provisional patent for 70 bucks? Yes, always. Um, but sometimes the company care less about the patent. Other times they're like, nah, we want the window dressing. Yeah, we still want to do the patent. Maybe they give you an advance on royalties, you give it to your attorney and you file the patent. Other ones are obsessed about the patent. So it varies with the company. So, but what people get confused on is first off, if you don't have to, and this is getting kind of advanced, but you're not licensing the patent if you don't have to. If you can make it just the product itself and it's not dependent on any patent, and a good percentage of the time we can get away with that with the licensing contracts we do with our students and the companies, that's fantastic. So then they need to pay you regardless. There's no, oh, well, if you get these claims on the patent, if the patent is issued or if it is, it, it is an issue, it doesn't matter. You get paid regardless. Okay. Um, and by the way, there are some tricks there. If, if they say, well, well, I want to pay you if it issues, you know, and I can guarantee that every one of your patents will always issue. And if you just have one claim in there that's really weak, that's very narrow, the patent office will give it to you. So one trick, if a company's beating you up about, oh, we're only going to pay you if it doesn't issue, we're going to lower the royalty rate or not pay you at all, which is pretty rare for them to do, by the way. It's not, it's not very common. But if they were doing that, um, you could just, you could say, okay, great. If it doesn't issue, you don't have to pay me anything. And then when you file a patent, you have your attorney put some weak claims in there and it will get issued. And it's amazing that some companies don't pick up on that. But to me, I don't think you're doing anything wrong when you do that. You came to them with the idea, you deserve to get paid for your product. They wouldn't have had the idea on their own. So it's totally okay. But don't think it's common because it's not. So getting back to Eva's question, it's the confusion. Like, what's the patent? Am I selling my patent? Most of the time, no. Hopefully, you're selling the product and its benefits. That's what you're truly selling. Is the licensing contract going to be dependent on the patent? Sometimes it is and sometimes not. So... The fact that they have to pay you, the patent doesn't do that. Now, if somebody violates your patent, you can go and sue them, but that's very expensive. We don't want that. So the licensing contract are all the terms. You need to pay me so much every quarter. If you don't, you know, you have the sell-off period. We can sell the product. You have to hand it back to me. There's tons of stuff in a licensing contract. So the licensing contract, Eva, is what stipulates on when they're going to pay you, how they're going to pay you, all the terms. And there's a lot of stuff to go through in there. Um, and you don't need a patent in order to do a licensing deal. Okay. Uh, now, always file a provisional patent. So uh, let's see what else we got here. Uh, okay. Mitchell Ferris. I have a product for the music industry. Is it, a, and it, it is an improvement on a hand exercise conditioner, do I need to have a musician testimonial in order to attract a licensee? I don't think you have to, but I think it would be a great idea, Mitchell. Um, I think when you have a when you have a, a musical product, and you know the people you show it to, again, you're showing it to manufacturers. Let's say it's something to do with a guitar, and you show it to a Fender a manufacturer of guitars. They know their business really well. So when you make that sell sheet, it's for their end user. It's for the guitar player, right? And you want them to look at your sell sheet and go, oh, yeah, I, I, we, you know, I think we can sell this. So you're showing them the marketing that they would eventually do to intrigue them. So to have a testimonial from a musician or two, heck, yeah, that's fantastic. Why not? Especially if it drives home the benefit of the product as well. Like you're, you got a benefit statement, a few bullet points, a few pictures, and the testimonials are driving it home. That doesn't hurt at all. But at the same time, they know their business. They know what guitar players want. So if you did a good job marketing it, it's not, it's not absolutely necessary to have testimonials. The music industry is one of those industries. It's a very personal industry. It's, uh, it's kind of like, a hip industry and I think particularly for that industry I, I would definitely do it Mitchell but it's not required a good percentage of our students um, sell sheets do not have testimonials but for the music industry I think it's good 
Um, medical might be good too. Um, that should be pretty easy for you to get. Uh, let's see. Okay, Erica, uh, Erica says, I get conflicting information regarding whether you should limit prior art searches, that's patent searches, um, to the US only if you're in the US, thank you. So um, there's this terminology called a prior art search. And a prior art search is not just a patent search. A lot of people get confused on this. A prior art search, and it's just a weird term that, that the patent office uses and patent attorneys use, prior art is anything that's ever been done and is in the public. So it could have been a product that was sold or it could have been something that was patented. Anything in the entire world that has ever been done is prior art. Um, so, Erica, one of the things that we guide our students to do is never ever, and I say this to shock you guys, so you, you know, you're paying attention, um, and so you get, so you remember, right? Never ever do a patent search first. Ever, ever, ever. Complete and utter and total waste of time. Now, I'm doing that to get your attention. Always do a market search first. So get onto Google Images, get onto Amazon. Google Images is my favorite. You know, you search regular Google, you'd be sifting through stuff forever. Inventors, all of us, were very visual people. So, and it's just more efficient. So to get on Google Images, not regular Google, you can do the search on Google and then you click on Images. It's not hard these days. And you'll see all these images. So if you had a unique doorstop and uh, easy to use doorstop, you could type that in and you'll see all these doorstops. And you're seeing everything that's in the marketplace. What is or isn't in the marketplace is way more important than what is or isn't patented. I'm trying to talk too fast there, huh? <laughs> so um, when you see a patent, it all that means, all it means is somebody threw a whole bunch of money at a patent attorney and they got a patent. Doesn't mean it's a good idea. Doesn't mean it's manufacturable. Doesn't mean any of that. But when you study the marketplace and you look at all the doorstops in the marketplace, you see all the products, you see the price points, you see the benefits, you get the lay of the land for all the easy to use doorstops that are out there. That's huge. That means so much more. And you should always be doing that first. Now getting eventually, I'm getting to Erica, your question. She's saying for a prior art search. Now that includes a market search, which most people skip over, always do that first, and a patent search. So she's saying, should I just search in the US? Technically, it's anything that's been done in the world. Now, a lot of times patent searchers, they won't search the world. And even if you search everything in the US, quite often you won't find everything. Um, it's, it's very uncommon that these other patents are a problem. And if you do see that they're a problem, they're quite often pretty easy to work around. Um, and I think I talked about um, reading claims last Q&A session. So you, you see, I'll just keep it short because I think I talked about that last time. You look at the picture in the patent, you're like, oh my God, that's it. But then you read through the claims and hopefully the claims aren't really long and they're written in patent speak, right? It's like, I don't know what the hell they're saying. And so you read claim number one and you read it like you have obsessive compulsive disorder. It's three sentences. You read it. I don't know what they're talking about. Again, 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 you read it six times. You're like, oh, they're just, they're just protecting that little hook. Well, that's not a problem for my invention. And you do that with all the claims. It's a pain in the butt. That's why the market search is more important. See what's selling out there. Um, but it technically, Erica, you should be searching all around the world. Now, even patent attorneys don't do that. But technically, you should. But to me, knowing the product fits in amongst these other, let's just say your product's a doorstop, amongst all these other doorstops, and it has a market at the right price with the right benefits, that is like a thousand times more important than any other prior patents. Okay. I, one thing, a funny thing that people talk about, which could happen, but, oh, I'm so afraid that somebody's going to sue me because I violated their patent. In the 20 years that Steve and I have been doing this, we've never seen it happen once with our students. Could happen, but it hasn't. Now, so, but it is a good idea to do a prior art search, which again is a market search on Google Images, Amazon, elsewhere and a patent search, good idea. So um, Mark says, when reaching out to CPG brands, I don't know who that is, what are the titles of the people I should be attempting to contact to get initial traction? So typically the, the titles of the people you wanna reach out to are marketing managers. 
um, with the secondary choice being salespeople because they kind of have to pick up the phone and respond to you, right? Um, so marketing managers, and especially if you can identify using LinkedIn, quite often it's a good place to do it, a marketing manager for a particular product line. So because they'll have many marketing managers in a lot of companies, and you can identify who those people are um, on, by calling the company or by uh, by going on LinkedIn. So mark, uh, marketing managers are great. Salespeople are great too. I would always go for marketing managers first and salespeople secondary. But if you're having a hard time getting a particular company, go with the salespeople. And don't assume that they're the right person. Ask them who the right person would be. And if they want to step up and say, that would be me, great. But give them the opportunity to pass the buck and pass you off to somebody else they'll serve you and it will serve them if they're busy and don't have time for you. So that's, that's a really simple tip guys, but it's, that's so important. The average inventor doesn't do that. They're not respectful of people's time. Um, okay. Uh, Deron Johnson, can I send my application to the patent office and do I check the box stating micro entity? Yes, you can directly submit your provisional patent. I'm assuming that's what you're talking about, um, Duran, um, to the patent office at USPTO.gov. And if you, I forget what the dollar figure is, but if you earn under a certain amount, check it on the website. I don't want to misquote it. If you earn under a certain amount of annual household income, you qualify as a micro entity. So that's $70 for the provisional patent. It's more if you don't qualify as a micro entity if you make more than that. Um, so yeah, uh, let's see, Lewis. How important is it to set up an LLC prior to, to pitching my idea? So guys, this is not legal advice. So if you need tax advice or legal advice, please contact a CPA or an attorney. But from a very practical standpoint, this is what I can say. Um, when you're licensing, you've got some of the reasons to file an LLC or a corporation or two. One, to limit your liability. I mean, that's what an LLC is, limited liability corporation. And two, um, to, you know, be able to write off a, a bunch of expenses and stuff. Now, if you're sole proprietorship, you can still do that. So I don't, you know, it's just one more thing to do. Companies don't care. They only care about your idea. They don't care that, oh, I've licensed these 20 other, just, they're just looking at this one product, that's it. Um, and most companies, they really, they really don't care. And so if you used Andrew Krauss Designs at Gmail and your email signature said Andrew Krauss, product developer, Andrew Krauss Designs, and your phone number rang to your cell phone, it said, hi, this is Andrew Krauss from Andrew Krauss Designs, and it didn't have kids screaming in the background, and you didn't pick up the phone when there's kids screaming in the background, you're preventing, you're presenting a professional appearance. So you could do the LLC when you're in the midst of doing your first licensing deal. And if you tell a company, look, I did this new LLC, I want to do the deal under this company, this, this new company, they could care less. So, and really when you're licensing, is somebody going to slip and fall on your sell sheet? Like you really don't have a lot of liability. So I don't think it's like critical that you do an LLC because it's just one more thing to do. Now in some states, it's like 50 bucks, 20 bucks. In California, I think it's like 800 bucks and it's a pain in the butt to maintain. Um, in Nevada where I am, I think it's like 250 plus some other costs. Um, so that's a, a, a decision that you need to make, Mark. But when you're licensing the invent right way, we teach you to limit your costs dramatically. Like for a lot of products, let's say you're working on a new product, forget about what you're working on now. For a lot of products, you could spend 70 bucks on a provisional, you could spend a few bucks on a sell sheet, and from the time you came up with the idea, I'm not saying most people do it in this timeline, but I'm saying it's possible, three weeks later, you could be showing it to companies. you know, And you don't need to blow all this money. So if you're not blowing all that money and you're showing the benefit of your product and getting the companies to be interested, you know, you're, you don't have all this, these expenses to write off. Right, but even if you're a sole proprietorship, you can file an LLC. You can still write off those expenses. It's still a business expense. So those are just some things to think about. I probably rambled on that too long. I'm sure Lewis is very happy about that, and probably some of the rest of you too. You're like, oh, phew, one less thing to do. At the same time, I'm not telling you don't do it because I don't know your situation. 
it's not legal advice. It's just some common sense thoughts on what you could do. Um, okay, uh, Casper. Um, <laughs> he put his name Casper the Fake. Okay, Casper. Uh, but I like your question. I am designing my product for the consumer market, but it could have very beneficial applications in the industrial market. This is a common question, guys. Is it possible to get my product licensed by two separate industries? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, you might have two lists of companies, one for the industrial version. And let's, let's give an example. Um, let's say it's vacuum cleaner. And one's an industrial vacuum cleaner for janitors. And one is a vacuum cleaner for consumers that you would buy at a Walmart or a Target or someplace like that. Here's the rule. As long as they're not stepping on each other's toes, it's totally okay. So you got to pick one. You could move forward with both of them at the same time. It's probably going to be two different marketing pieces, two different sell sheets, two different lists of companies, and, and just see what hits first. And quite often, if you can get the first one, let's say the consumer one, um, you can get them to pay for your patent, cover the whole thing, the industrial version, the consumer version, but in the licensing contract, it only gives them the rights for the consumer version. Tell them you'd like to license this in industrial version. You see they're not in industrial vacuum cleaners. They're like, yeah, sure, that doesn't bother us. Go out and do a deal with an industrial vacuum cleaner company. Absolutely, you can do that. Um, but you have to decide, you have to take a look at it and see if it makes sense. But the big takeaway for everybody else here is not just industrial versus not. It's always like, well, I'll make more money if I license it to five companies. Well, that ain't going to happen if both companies are on the same shelf at Walmart. That makes no sense. They're stepping on each other's toes. The other one doesn't have an advantage. But if it's a different distribution channel, it's a different, um, which is like a different, whole different set of stores, it's a different geography, it's a different version of the product for a different market, then you might be able to do multiple licenses. But a good percentage of the time, our students, when they do a deal, it's with one company. But there's plenty of scenarios in which you can close more. But don't think that if I do a deal with three companies in the same exact area, I'll be making more money. And it's not the case. That one big company, they want that point of difference. And they're really big, which, which leads me just to a random uh, uh, comment, which I, I like to talk about. When you're licensing, and it's kind of a joke, but it's not, you can have delusions of grandeur and you're not delusional. You can, when you license to that big company, you are that big company because you know, you're utilizing their money, their workforce, and their existing distribution. So on your own, to raise enough money to sell a half a million units a year, it depends if it's a 99 cent product, if it's a $100 product or $600 product, depends on the product. Um, might be completely unrealistic. But that big company, they'd be like, yeah, that's normal for us, or 20000 or whatever it is. So I always kind of joke, you can be a little delusional, and you're not when you're licensing, because the companies are really big. They can do big things. And it would be very hard from you starting a one SKU, one product company from scratch. Nobody's going to want to give you the money. Retailers hate one SKU, one product companies. When you license to that company with 10 products, you are them. So not only can they get it into major retailers, but they have the sales force to keep it there, get the pricing down, keep all that. Where your product, you venture it yourself, you're selling one product, you could be doing well, but they're going to favor that big company, kick you off the shelf, because to make that um, manufacturer's rep for another manufacturer happy, right? And so it's very, very hard to start a one product company. If you do ever decide to start your own company and sell it yourself, you're not going to survive with one product. Retailers will never keep you on the shelf. You're going to need to come up with a whole product line. You're like, oh, damn, Andrew, this isn't what I wanted. I just wanted to work on my inventions. I didn't want to start a whole company and now do, because I did sandals. Now I can only do sandals. I wanted to do dog toys and I want to do medical devices and other things too. So you limit yourself um, when, you, when you try to start your own company. It's, it's all good. I mean, that's right for some of you. That's okay for some of you. But most of you, I've found, don't want to do that. Um, okay, uh, Amir, how prepared should I be before contacting an inventor-friendly company? I'm 
just a student with no income, should I take a chance and pitch them without a PPA? Thank you for the answer. So first off, I think licensing is one of the careers of the future. So I really love to see, I don't know, Amir, if you're a college student, but you said you're a student. I love to see college students getting involved with licensing because I think that um, a job is not what it used to be. It's not stable like it used to be. And when you can be relying on yourself to create income, whether it's part-time with your, with your full-time job or whether you're doing it full-time eventually after royalties come in, always keep your day job before you go full-time with licensing because you want the money to be coming in. Um, you know, it's a great time to, to be licensing and I think that in college is a great time to start. Any time is a great time to start. Um, but what he's asking is, uh, how should I prepare before contacting an inventor-friendly company? Is first off, Amir, you don't need to know they're inventor-friendly. You shouldn't look for confirmation of that. Um, if they're in a major retailer where you want to be, you should reach out to them. Now, if they have a submission page on their site and that's unfriendly, okay, they're not friendly. I'm not going to submit to those guys. But don't like obsess with are they inventor-friendly or aren't they? If they're in a major retailer you want to be in, you should be approaching them. The other question you had is, um, should I take a chance and pitch them without a PPA? Well, if, I don't know how broke you are. I mean, I remember being a student. I understand. But a provisional patent is only $70. You don't have to have a patent attorney do it. You can do it yourself. Um, so I really highly recommend filing a, a, a PPA. Um, now, with that said, again, what I'm saying is you guys should always file a PPA. Um, but privately showing your product for license is not considered public disclosure. At the same, and at the same time, you're also creating a paper trail. I still would not advise doing it. I'm not going to get into all the details. But if you really wanted to go out on a limb, Amir, you could present your product and later file a PPA. But there's some problems with that. And um, would it bite you in the butt? In most industries, probably not. But again, our advice is to always file a PPA, um, so to always do it. There's certain industries like novelty that they just really don't care that much about, about patents. So there's certain industries where I, I, I wouldn't be filing a PPA every two minutes. You make a relationship with a company and they're like, you know, not interested in this one, but yeah, we like you. We, we like what you're doing there. And you're like, hey, I've got five more novelty gag gifts and can I send them to you? You make that relationship, that might make sense. You know, but again, you're still putting yourself out in the limb a little bit. You file a PPA, you got that priority date. Um, but you also have the paper trail you created with them. So if they ran out and filed something, you could show the paper trail and you could show they weren't the first true inventor. Um, so, but I, I would always file it. Uh, Courtney says, love this. Do you think it's still worth to go to stores to look at packaging for potential licensees, or is it more effective to go online for trade show lists, other databases, et cetera? I think it's great to go to the store. Um, on on a online note, I don't know if I, maybe I mentioned this on our last Q&A session too, but I'll keep it quick. I've noticed that our InventRight students that are in Europe or Australia are places other than the U.S. and Canada, they do a better job with making their list of companies because they don't make assumptions. You guys quite often, you know, oh, well, you know, I know the sporting good retailers. Near me, it's Dick's and Big Five Sporting Goods and this other one. And, you know, yet on the West Coast or the East Coast or wherever opposite coast you're on, it's a whole different set of retailers. So I find that our international students don't make assumptions of who the retailers are, because if you make your list of retailers, then you're looking online at those retailers for companies that you can license to. And if your list of retailers is too small, your list of companies will be too small. So um, online is fantastic, especially with this whole virus thing. Um, now is a great time just to be going online. I find it to be extremely efficient. It's way more efficient than going to stores, but you, you miss something sometimes. I mean, you have a category, and you can look on a category, and the categories are a little different online on, let's say, Target.com than in the store, where they're mishmash and they're next to each other. So um, I think that being in the store, you can pick it up, you can you can touch it, you can feel it, you can play with it. Now you can do some funky things online these days. Sometimes 
it doesn't list the name of the manufacturer, but you can literally spin the box around or you can look at it from different angles. You can zoom in you, and you can see the name of the company on the packaging. Quite often they'll list it in the, uh, in the, the description. And that's another great tip I'll give you for online searching for companies is you might go to one website, let's say Target, and you, there's this, um, it's a certain type of baby sponge, let's say, okay? And they're not listing the name of the company. But you Google that same name of the product and you find it show up on five other sites. And one of those sites, it lists the name of the company. So I find that the average inventor isn't persistent enough to do stuff like that, to dig and dig and dig and research to get the name of the company if it just isn't right there in front of their face. So always dig. So um, Courtney, I agree. I think going to stores is fantastic. Um, but I don't think it's necessary. I think a lot of most of our students don't do it anymore. Um, but it is beneficial. But you can't go to every store because they won't be near you. Because there's a ton of stores that aren't near you. Every one of you out there, there's stores that aren't near you and you're missing it because you need to Google and find those stores. So, but going to stores and playing, looking at products and maybe you buy one too. I mean, don't go, don't go buy and everything, you know, maybe just take a picture of it. Then you don't need to buy it. Um, but going to stores can be fantastic still. But uh, in this day, this temporary phase with the virus thing, don't feel like it's a necessity whatsoever. And it really isn't um, in general, but there's benefits of doing it. Um, oh, okay, so Andrew uh, Darlow says, what are some of the biggest mistakes inventors make when submitting a PPA, uh, provisional patent application? I always wonder if what I leave out will cause issues for me. Um, I haven't known a single one of our students that filed a PPA and it later caused them an issue in 20 years of doing this with students in 65 countries. You know, now, does that mean you do a poor job with your provisional? No, and I'll give my advice that I always give, and I might have given this in our other session too, is 80% of filing a provisional patent is not about legal speak, because you can write a, a provisional patent in common English. It's about being an inventor. And the average inventor, especially, and some of you may go, oh, that's me. You've been thinking about your idea for a long time. You lose your creativity. I'll say that again. You lose your creativity. It becomes fixed in your mind as to what this invention is, and you're not flexible. One of the, the not one of the most important thing you can do when you're filing your provisional patent and you're filing yourself or with an attorney is to knock yourself off. So you got to go, okay, I'm, I'm convinced this this is the invention it's my sunglasses with with the it waves right here so it's going to retain the sunglasses better on your head when you're doing vigorous exercise but then you got to say what are the other ways i could do it and you throw all that in your provisional you don't get crazy you don't throw a version that's half as good that's an utter waste of time you could spend months making this giant provisional which you can if you want but it's a waste of time but throwing the version at 70% as good at 80%, just as good, but not the version you're pitching, that is the biggest mistake inventors make. And so thinking like, well, this is it, this is it. No, think about what else it could be. Think about if this product was a huge success, how would another company do it differently? Throw all that in your PPA. That's the biggest mistake inventors make. Um, so if you do that, Andrew, um, you'll be doing pretty good. You're already doing good. Your name's Andrew, so hey. Um, <laughs> Um, Francisco, can you suggest a good marketing book? Yeah, our book. Our book is uh, One Simple Idea uh, by my partner Stephen Key, and it's called One Simple Idea. It's yellow, and if you go into Amazon, you type in One Simple Idea, you'll find it, and it's going to show you how to license your products. So that's what I would recommend, uh, Francisco. I think. Uh, you're asking for a marketing book. Um, I think that the average inventor struggles with making a good marketing piece. And so I'll give you some advice there. And this is sound, might sound extreme, but it's so true. There's two types of ways you can, what you can send people. You can send a cell sheet, which is an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. Let's see. Eight and a half by eleven piece of paper. You're not going to mail it. 
but you're going to send it as a PDF, which is an electronic document. You're going to email it. That's it. No double-sided, no two pages, no slide decks, no PowerPoints, none of that. One page. And you can't throw everything in the kitchen sink in there. Like when you see a magazine advertisement or a billboard when you go down the freeway, does it have tons of stuff in there, like 20 different features? Nobody will freaking read it. So I'm not exaggerating, guys. They need to get your idea, your product, the benefit of it in six to 10 seconds. If they don't, you're toast. You're toast. So one of the best things to do is to put that on your laptop or your computer. Laptop's great because, and family, friends, I don't care, even if they're super supportive or super critical, um, you're not going to say a damn thing. If, if you've talked to them about your invention, they're toast. You cannot show this to them and do this test. Put it on your laptop, your cell sheet, and spin it around. Don't say anything and look at their face. Don't explain anything and see if they look confused. See what questions they ask. Don't answer any questions. And if there's confusion there, well, then you need to fix it. And so that is uh, free um, feedback that you can get. And I don't care if they're family or friends. Family or friends aren't typically the best people to get advice from because usually the thing they'll say is, and this is flattering if they say this, you better get a patent on that. What they really mean is it's a great idea. Somebody's going to steal it. You better get a patent on it. It's very flattering. Be flattered, but don't do that. You know, file a provisional patent. It, just because they said that doesn't mean you go out and spend 10000 on a patent. And I know some of you have already filed patents. That's fine. But something to think about. Don't every time somebody says it's a good idea, run out and spend all that money on a patent. Um, so let's see. I lost track of – suggest a good marketing book. So my, my suggestion is one simple idea, our book. I think that will help you out tremendously. So um, let's see. Uh, Apophis, that's a cool name. Have you ever got a licensing deal with a design registration on an invention? So there's utility patents, which is the way something functions, and there's design patents, which is merely just the way it looks. So let's say these eyeglasses were the invention. It would just literally be a picture. It was not a picture. It's a line drawing of the invention. So d design patents can be very limited in a lot of ways, but they can also be very powerful. But they're also more expensive. So um, a design patent is cheaper than a utility, but it's more expensive than a provisional. So 95% of you are going to be filing a design, uh, you, sorry, a provisional patent, which is a utility, uh, a provisional utility patent um, for 70 bucks, and that's going to be the way they go. Sometimes it really, there's no way I could answer, and that's going to be the way they go. Sometimes it really, there's no way I could answer that, uh, Apophis. Um, because I would need to know what your invention is to know if a, a design would make sense. But sometimes it can make sense and you can be clever with it. And you can absolutely get a, uh, a licensing deal with a design patent. Our students are getting licensing deals with no patent at all. They got a provisional company's like, well, we don't want to do a patent. And there's no patent filed and they still pay them royalties. So can you do a deal with a design patent? Absolutely. But it's quite a bit more expensive than a provisional. So I wouldn't go running out. And there is no provisional design patent, which is probably your next question, which everybody asked. There's no such thing. Um, let's see. So factum, is it possible to use a prior invention, tweak the invention with durable materials in order to make it my own idea? Um, without looking at it specifically factum, I, I can't say. I, I, if you're offering new functionality, and utility, then yes. And so keep this in mind, and this isn't exactly what your question was, but a lot of products don't have patents, guys. So if you, especially like if you see eight companies like having this certain feature, more than likely that's not a, uh, that's not a patented thing, you know? And so if you're like, well, I'll, I'll do that feature too, and then I'll add something to it. So you have to take a look to see if anybody has patents there. But a lot of what the products that are out there are patented and it's public domain. And then your piece of it is an addition or an improvement. And you're going to get your provisional patent on that improvement, on that little piece of it. So a lot of times we're, people worry like, oh, well, there's a lot of stuff like that. And then I want to do mine. And so if they have a patent on that, and you're going to use that exact thing with an improvement, 
Well, then you're padding on top of what they're doing and you need their permission. But a lot of times you could just go right around it. And then people are like, oh, Andrew, but then people can get around me. Well, going back to what I said earlier, you want to think about all the variations so people can't get around you. Okay. Um, how much time do we have left? We have 10 minutes left. Cool. Uh, wow, geez, we've got a lot of questions here. This is cool. Uh, Uh, Charlie says, hi, I have a couple products that are business promotional products. So I'm assuming he's talking about like a, a, a pen or something like that with a company name on it. And those, those are called promotional products to be coffee mug, T-shirt, other things. Um, for example, you see companies give away bottles with their logo on it. Is there a specific niche industry for this type of product? I don't really know what your question is there, Charlie. Um, you know, what I can say is the promotional products industry is a weird industry. Um, the distribution channels are very strange, and I can't go into it here. I have a hard time explaining it to our students, but it's a very weird industry um, with the way the distribution channels work. I would recommend getting involved with the, with the industry associations. Maybe they'll give you some um, documentation paperwork to show you how the industry works. Um, but is there, he's saying, is there a specific niche for this type of industry, the promotional product industry? Yeah, I think there's a lot of different niches in promotional products for different purposes, definitely. So what I would recommend you do is look at all the promotional products out there, get the lay of the land, look at all the players, look at all the different types of products. And so I, I, without knowing more, I can't be more specific than that, but I think that was probably helpful to you and everybody else. Um, Okay, Gabriel, hi, Andrew, today's my birthday. Hey, happy birthday, Gabriel, congratulations. Gabriel, just a second, guys. Uh, hi, Andrew, today's my birthday. Anyway, you, you all always say stay in one industry. We don't really say that. We say that there's a lot of benefits to staying in an industry. So if you're really prolific, you could stay in one industry, and you could be in another as well. You could be in two industries. But the benefit of staying in an industry is, you know, let's say you show um, 30 companies your invention and 25 weren't interested, but you ask them, are they open to more? You utilize, when you sent them that idea, that was an opportunity to make the connection. Using your invention, you're making the connection. And most of them, they saw that one, so they, oh yeah, you can send me more. And literally, next time you have an invention, you still got to look at the product line. And you, you look at those 25 companies, and you're like, oh, you know, 15 of these 25 would be right for this product number two. You got their email, you got the contact information, bam, you're right in there. So we're not saying one, it could be two, or it could be three, depending on how prolific you are. There's a huge benefit to staying in industry. Every time they say no, you just made the relationship. You did not waste your time because you didn't license that one company. So very beneficial. Um, However, I have ideas for multiple industries. So historically, our students were in a lot of industries. You can jump around. You have that ability. And maybe at the beginning, Gabriel, you want to do that. Maybe you want to do that to figure out which industry you like. And then you're like, oh, I'm going to stay in this industry. So I don't see any harm in that. Um, but it will take you a little longer to get you where you're going. So you wrote, is this a deal breaker? Um, no, it's, it's not. I think it's absolutely fine. Uh, but realize all the efforts you put into project number one can be reutilized for project number two if you have projects in that same industry. Okay, so that's that's a great tip, great information, guys. That's really going to help you guys out a lot, and because it'll help you out with your mindset too, because you're you're not you're gonna always not you're not going to be thinking like oh I'm wasting my time because you're not if every company is not interested. So you got get into that mindset, very beneficial mindset. Um, uh, Jill Glee, Glee? Glee says, uh, I'm an engineering student. I developed a new part. I a new part. Okay. I have great feedback from engineers. All right. Um, I would add, make sure you get great feedback from marketing people too. Now working on the patent with a lawyer. How do I know how much my invention is worth? I plan to talk to Bosch to license. So you'll find out they don't know either. 
until they start selling it and you're receiving royalties, you don't know. But a big part of talking with the companies, interviewing them about what their intentions are for the product and then holding them to that in the licensing contract. And it's only then that can you start to assess how much money can be earned. And you're just doing that to assess the minimum guarantees, the minimum amount they need to pay you regardless. And if they sell more than that, well, then you're going to make more. They don't know. You don't know. You can never know. Anybody that tells you I'm going to value, a value your patents and your product, you know, I mean, you can look at the market and go, well, this has huge potential because there's these products here and they're selling well and I've got this improvement. But you don't have to give it a specific dollar amount because if you team up with a big company, the right company, Bosch would be amazing. Um, they're going to sell as many as they're going to sell and you're going to get that royalty and you're not going to ask for upfront money. That's the biggest rookie move on the face of the planet. So you don't need to evaluate it so you can ask for half a million up front or something. You should never be doing that to begin with. You get your money on the back end. As they make money, you make money. Okay. Uh, let's see. We have four minutes left. Um, you guys liking this? If you want to, if you want to type in what you what you think, if you guys feel like this is helpful, not helpful, whatever, type it in the chat. Maybe I'll read a few of those before we we wind up. Um, uh, uh, this is a great question, August. Uh, by the way, Madeline, thank you so much. Uh, Madeline's helping out. She's uh, helping out with uh, directing some of the questions to me. Thank you so much, Madeline, for your help. Um, and for the promotion of the of this uh, live YouTube broadcast, uh, Augusta Sun <laughs> Eleven, uh, do you need to wait for feedback from one company before pitching a number uh, another? I have around eight companies targeted. Do I get to them all at once or one at a time? All at once, man. All at once. <laughs> Just imagine you get interest from a company and it goes back and forth, back and forth, which is common. Two and a half months. Ah, uh, we decide we're not interested. Call a bunch more companies. Get another one interested. Back and forth, back and forth. Three months. Oh, we're interested. You drag this thing out forever. You hit them all at the same time. You move forward with them all at the same time as if the others aren't interested. It's rare that you get to the final contract stage with multiple. Rare. So having interest from multiple, perfectly fine. I know you feel so honored that they showed interest, but they owe, you owe them nothing until they sign on the dotted line. And it will take you forever if you do one at a time and get interest. Get it out to everybody all at the same time. That was a great question to answer on, um, to, to end on. So that was fantastic. Um, so, yeah, Augusta Sun 11 said, thanks. Just got rejection from my number one company. I'll move to the next one, exclamation mark. Great attitude. Fantastic. Um, Tommy, stay safe. Uh, people wear your masks. Uh, invent right you rock thank you tommy uh, uh augusta the sun perfect thanks um yeah if you guys want to type in before we leave thank you madeline um type in what's the best type in your time zone pacific central mountain eastern type in when you when your favorite time would be for us to do the next live q and a if you could do that just do it at the bottom of the chat right now That'd be fantastic. Um, let's see. Thank you, Michelle. Great job, Andrew. Uh, uh, Marie, uh, it's awesome. Or Mar Mari, sorry. It's awesome when you go live. I just wished I could have logged in earlier. I just joined because I've been working with my regular job. So, Marie, um, this will be on YouTube. Uh, Madeline, I think it's almost immediately, if not, you know, within an hour or something, it'll be on our YouTube channel and you'll be able to watch the replay. So if any of you missed any of it, great. Um, people are typing in. One person said 5% 5, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, another person said 6 p.m. Eastern. 5 um, Eastern. We'll, we'll look at the chat and we'll well, uh, but if you can't make it, what's nice about these, I would like it if as many of you can attend live because you can ask questions when we do it next. Um, and we will do it, be doing it next week again. Um, but if you can't, you can watch the replay. So at least you can benefit either way there. Okay, great guys. I think we, we hit the hour. I'm going to, I'm going to call it a, uh, well, it's not evening for me. It's 3 o'clock for some of you on Eastern time. It's an evening. I want to remind everybody to take care. Keep.
Sorry about that. Somebody was trying to call me. I want to remind everybody to take care, keep inventing, and we'll catch up with you next time. See you, everybody. Bye. Thanks for the great questions.